Three tables away sat a group of young men, one of whom had a nose that looked as if it had been in an argument with a fist. His skin was pockmarked and he was talking loudly about the rights of citizens. He had no doubt drunk more than a skinful of wine, for he kept standing up and shouting out, Citizens, the wind is changing. The old regime will be blown away. All is dust. All is dust. His friends quickly pulled him back down onto his seat. Yan had been watching all this intently and had not at first noticed Tetu wrapping his muffler about himself and putting on his hat. Where are you going? I have someone to see. I'll be back in a couple of hours. You're to wait here for me. If Milkaya comes looking for us, make yourself scarce. Tetu set off purposefully, across the Pont Marie, towards the left bank. He knew that he had to get the boy out of Paris. The only hope of doing so lay with a friend of his, the English banker Charles Cordell. He walked on, remembering the night all those years ago at the theatre in Le Havre, where he had first met Cordell. The two of them had struck up an unlikely friendship. Their mutual interest, to begin with at least, was magic, for Cordell fancied himself something of an amateur conjurer. Cordell soon realised that prejudice made people underestimate the dwarf. Tetu was not taken seriously, so he was told things other men would never have heard. Ladies confided in him, young men spouted their views. The dwarf listened to the gossip of the coffee houses, the prittle prattle of the salons, and the oratory of the clubs. Cordell, like Tetu, knew that these places were where the real intrigue lay. The two would meet regularly at the Café Royale, where Tetu would tell Cordell all he had heard and seen. This information gave the banker a clearer idea of what was going on and how best to advise his clients. The snow was still falling as Tetu made his way towards the Rue du Dragon, with its grand, imposing houses. He stood waiting for what felt like a lifetime before a housekeeper came hurrying out, carrying a lantern. Is Monsieur Cordell in? I need to see him, urgently. Will you say that Tetu is here? The housekeeper went inside, closing the door behind her. Tetu stood waiting, stamping his feet and blowing on his frozen hands. The door opened again, and he was shown into the hall. His teeth were chattering as the housekeeper took his coat, hat and muffler. He stamped the snow off his shoes as he heard the door above him open and looked up the stairwell at Charles Cordell. Tetu had never been more pleased to see his friend's grave, bespectacled face. Why, my dear friend, you look half frozen, said Cordell, coming forward with his hand outstretched. I need your help. I am in a great deal of trouble, said Tetu and before he had even been taken into the elegant drawing-room, he had told Cordell the story of Topolin's death. He is a great loss, said Cordell, taking Tatu over to the fire and bringing out a bottle of cognac. So, Kalyovsky, Tatu nodded. I have been a complete idiot, he said angrily, I knew he was a master of disguise, yet I too was nearly taken in by him. Do you know what gave him away? His hands. His large, ugly hands. 